I don't think there was anything specific that they would go home. Stevenson was the place, right? But no, it's anywhere. It doesn't It's just Canada. My name is Susumu Tabata. And, but I've been called Sus ever since uh, I was born, I think, by many people, including my father. <laughs> my father was uh, a carpenter. He went into fishing, but because of the uh, naturalization law, he couldn't get naturalized. So that uh, eliminated him from the fishing, uh, direct fishing. So he went to uh, onto a packer boat, which collect fish. And then even uh, the captain of those vessels were excluded because of this uh, law. So he went to the engine room and became an engineer on the boat, on the packer boat. And that's where he stayed until the beginning of the war. There were lots of statues. You can even get a job as a ditch digger with the municipality, all the government jobs were frozen to, to, to uh, Asiatics, not only Japanese, but Chinese, East Indians. And my mother was only 19 years old when she came to Canada, so, you know, they came from a, a family who had the background in uh, some village, and presumably there's some agriculture involved because there's no other type of occupation at that time during Japan. Some of his friends said that maybe he came because to avoid conscription. Now this is, uh, again, uh, uh, one of the, his acquaintances' remarks, so we don't know. But I think uh, my mother's uh, <coughs> comment that uh, he, public, she, uh, he, he and my uh, uncle came to Canada to earn enough money to pay off that debt my grandfather had this probably true. 1929, 30, 31, those are the real bad times. And I remember uh, my uh, father was working at 10 cents an hour and my, my mother was working at 8 cents an hour at the farm, 10 hours a day. My uncle had a very large acreage uh, on the dike, and uh, on that dike were about six different households, including ours. And uh, I think uh, he kind of rent, uh, let them rent free, I think. And even the, uh, as far as our house was concerned, I think all the utilities were paid by them. They were very, very generous people particularly uh, my uh, uncle. His name was Chunematsu uh, Atagi, and he had the four sons there. And uh, he was, I would say he was one of the most generous person I knew. I wonder if we, we would have survived if it, was, if it wasn't for them. I think they were big, uh, big help to us. The great majority of the Japanese people were living in cannery houses. And uh, so people with uh, means were very few. You could just count it within 10 fingers. And so they were, most of them were not well off, but at the same time, they were not suffering. Uh, you know, they were not starving, shall we say, because they had these canneries, I think, that was very generous too, because the, the cannery wanted these fishermen because they were very good fishermen, you see. The house we lived in was very, very small, tiny, 500 square feet, maybe. Yeah, we were one of the, uh, the family that have um, more than, say, half a dozen. There were others, but... Uh, we're, we were one of them. Four brothers and six sisters. Our section was toward the uh, extreme west side, and people were very, very de decent, and they concerned about uh, the, uh, the neighbors. So 
when we were growing up, I think we were very well looked after. They kept an eye on us, so to speak. He was an, I think they must have maybe one or two thousand people there, mostly in the fishery business. Elementary school, oh, well, that's where we went. It's called Lord Bean School in Stevenson. School, it was, <coughs> of course, it was segregated in a way. But the people who were very good in English or caught on to English very rapidly, they were in a section with the uh, Caucasian. Racial prejudice was a normal thing in those days. You know, we were not the only one that suffered. Even the French Canadian kids suffered. Uh, you know, and, and because we were a, a sort of a majority, the Japanese uh, uh, school kids were a majority, sometimes we have to uh, help the French Canadian students because they were kicked around. Well, we were quite aware of what was going on politically, you know, it was pretty bad. You know, there were these politicians who were, you know, they got votes because they favored uh, that kind of thing at that time. But the, uh, you know, what I remember most about my childhood days in school is that we had some excellent teachers. And some teachers, I wish I could uh, meet, meet them because they were so good. You know, even Canadian history was so interesting. And this uh, lady taught that. And she must have been a Scottish person because uh, we learned lots of Scottish songs. <laughs> It was funny because we, we knew more Scottish so songs than the Scottish friends we had. I think on the average we did better than the Occidental. I think it's because we, we studied more. I think that's because of that. I think the, our parents uh, did emphasize uh, the value of, uh, of education, I think. Well, my happiest memory would be, A, to fool around in the uncle's boat house. We would use all those big machinery and fool around, so that was very pleasant. And the next most pleasant thing for myself was uh, fishing. You know, you, uh, you, uh, you went as an assistant to, uh, to, uh, to the gillnet uh, fishery people, and uh, I think at that time, I, I would say that we were between 13 and 15, but uh, it was really good, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, camaraderie and uh, comradeship was amongst the fishing people really good. So it was very good. We enjoyed that. Well, I think, you know, I think we were fed quite a bit of uh, really first-rate propaganda from Japan. So uh, the parents were kind of brainwashed by the uh, news coming from Japan that this, uh, you know, there's uh, hostility between U.S. and uh, Japan type of thing. So we could uh, see that there's something coming, you know. Yeah. So we knew that uh, they're going to do something and then the, uh, see, the, in Japan, the, uh, the military took over and, and, and they came up with this propaganda about you know, how great they are and that kind of thing, and how they're going to save Asia type of thing, which uh, in retrospect, well, you know, was uh, almost hockey. A few households had radios, so we listened to the news in the days, and they told us, you know, this is what happened. So. Yeah, we were, uh, I think it was a mix, you know, I said, is that a good thing, you know, happening? And in those days, we didn't think too much about people being killed and that kind of thing. But philosophically, we thought, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing, you know? So we weren't too sure. About 30, about 3,000 people around it. And, uh, and they were considered suspicious. But some of the things, people who were rounded up, you know, there was some high school, you know, principal of Japanese school, I you know uh, some business people, people who owned uh, sawmills and that kind of thing. But among them was, uh, was, uh, was uh, 
barber, you know, and uh, and we had a very distant relative who uh, who got drowned, and we just couldn't kind of figure out how a, a person. He was almost, you know, I don't know. He said absolutely nothing, you know. He just. And uh, he got rounded up, and we used to wonder why would he be rounded up because he was almost a good for nothing. He worked hard, but uh, so some of the speculations were that he probably told the Indians, you know, the the uh, the First Nation people that Jesus, you know, when Japan take over, they say you guys will be treated better or something. So this is a. Uh, a funny thing, but we used to <laughs> see that sort of thing. <laughs> but he was a very hopeless, hopeless person. But that's how what happened. Father was uh, already in a road camp because they all went. Uh, the able-bodied people went to the road camp. It's somewhere, Blue River, Jasper, that area. You know, and uh, so he, able-bodied people were there. Lots of old people. I know some people who were, you know, shoemakers, and another one of our neighbors hasn't worked, didn't, hasn't done any hard labor for maybe 20 years. Of course, those people died right away, you know. We were in the road camp for a couple of months and they died because they, they, you know, it was, they can't handle all that road work, you know, moving rocks and that kind of thing. So, uh, and uh, quite a few of the able-bodied people went to Ontario, for example, in road camps and so on. But uh, we have to come back to some <coughs> some other government policy that was absolutely stupid, and one of them was to separate this uh, family. So they decided that later. Uh, Toward maybe uh, May, June of '42, that was a stupid thing to to do. So they start letting family go as a unit. Well, my father and them, and, uh, and I don't know how many, a couple dozen people, went before that. So when they heard that uh, these people were allowed to do that, they uh, said that we like to do that too. And the government said, "Oh no, you can't." So it's. Uh, so they went on a revolt and more or less went on a strike. And we're not going to uh, work anymore. And we want to join the family. And the, and the government says, no, you can't. So they resisted and then they were sent back to the coast, to the immigration office, I think, to the, uh, at, at the Barard, at foot of Barard, under armed guard. In Richmond, we were allowed to continue until we were forced out. And in our case, it was something like April or May. We went on the CPR train, mainly. You know, because places like Greenwood was on the Kettle Valley Line, we went as far as Nelson, and from Nelson to a place called, what was it, Lardo or Belfort or someplace. And then from there we took the uh, Lake Ferry to Castle. So that's how we went. We were housed in an old uh, hotel in some old buildings, like uh, I think there's a... Uh, I think we first went to uh, Langham Hotel in Castle. And then I think we, uh, you know, it, it was an emergency thing. Eh? So then we, then we got dispersed to, I think my family went to a place uh, above the drugstore or something. And there, you know, surprisingly, two families have to stay in a place the size of, let's see, that will be 10 feet by 10 feet. Horribly crowded and no privacy whatsoever. 
And things got better, you know, and because we were sleeping on a place uh, in a wooden uh, uh, bunk bed, so we didn't even have a mattress. And we, we used to we used to uh, complain to the uh, the to the authority that it's kind of hard sleeping on a wood type of thing. And then finally, we got mattresses, but it was uh, very crowded at first. So uh, in you know in Castle that was. Uh, ex uh, mining town, so they had lots of hotels and that kind of thing. So uh, we stayed in one hotel, the Langham Hotel, which now is a museum. And uh, let's see, there were in a spot, we had uh, room for eight people, but there were only two, four, six, maybe only six people live in that place. And they had a communal kitchen. As they built more uh, facilities, it got better. And toward the end, we had one room toward the end in Castle with only two guys in the 10 by 10s. So it wasn't bad. But some of the houses were so cold, you know, Castle winter, that uh, when I uh, tried to put the shoes on, it was frozen. Some people were lucky enough to. Uh, be housed in, a, say, about four families in a, a private home type of thing. So those are the fortunate ones. My mother had to look after all those say, eight kids or whatever, and that's, you know, I, I, that occupies the, the whole mind, I think. You know, so much uh, anxiety, but, uh, nah, you know, she talked about it, but, uh, I don't think uh, she told us about her anxiety. No, we just felt it. Food, well, we had, uh, I think, uh, adequate supply of uh, rice, for example, which was very, very important to the Orientals. And I think we had enough uh, Rush, you know, we had to use ration coupon then. Things like butter or sugar, I think. We, we had sufficient. No, I mean, it's, uh, it's not as plentiful, but it was sufficient. We could live on it. But uh, then uh, for, for those people who's like our, our uh, family, who the father is not earning any money because he's in the uh, internment camp, we got uh, government grants for food, but uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, that much. In fact, uh, I don't think we ever ate so much uh, uh, cabbage and wieners, for example. Lots and lots of them. And, uh, you know, but still, when you think about it, uh, it was still better than who, people who went to the sugar beets, you know. So when, so when we get, got to Castle, we were uh, in anyway, grade 11. We were permitted to go to the high school here. And uh, this kind of thing was not available to people in other localities. But I think we were very, very fortunate in Castle, they admitted us. Teachers were good and students, most of the students were very good. They're not, in fact, those people there in the Kootenays, uh, you know, they thought we were monsters before we came, but uh, after they found out that uh, we were not monsters, uh, they uh, they became very friendly and, you know, and we still correspond with some of them, still after 50 years. So, uh, you know, as a, we used to put out uh, variety concerts and that kind of thing. And there were some talents, you know, like our friend from Stevenson was a tremendous harmonica player. And there was a guy from uh, Vancouver who became our conductor of this uh, harmonica band. So we played, you know, at the uh, high school and various places. And uh, the others who had talent in acting and that kind of thing, uh, you know, they sang and uh, singers. We had enough talent there <laughs> to have a variety of concerts. That was fun, though.
the, the principal, apparently, I was told later, in fact, I uh, just told last year that he was a Quaker. So he was, you know, he was a diff different person, a very, very good person. And uh, he was the one, I think, uh, you could say that one of the people that changed our life, myself and some others. In those days, the high school had, had a one hour per week course called Guidance. And there you learn politics, how to conduct meetings, and all sorts of things, and what the careers. And one of the uh, questionnaires was, do you like to go to, uh, to university? So myself and another friend of mine said, yes. And uh, do you pl uh, plan to go? He says, no. So we said, why not, they said. Well, it's too late because we never took foreign language. In order to go to a university, you had to have matriculation, and we didn't take those courses. Well, he says it's not that late now. Well, what we thought it was late. It was Valentine's Day around that time, and uh, we didn't have even one year of foreign language. So he said, well, why don't you take French or Latin? Or just the two, there was one teacher who taught both of them, and they were very, very good, conscientious teachers. And he says, well, try it. Try their first year Latin. So myself and this guy, we enrolled in the first year. And then in June, we took the second year and, and wrote the exam for second year Latin. And third year, we took the four year. So anyway, that's how we learned Latin. And... Uh, so we had the matriculation by the time we left uh, Castle. And we decided that we couldn't still go to a uh, university at UBC, so we decided to take a correspondence course in senior matric. And we did that. It took us two years, but, uh, you know, because we have to do, the ex like physics and chemistry, you have to do experiments. So we did that. And, uh, and uh, wh while doing that, we had to move to uh, Midway, another uh, ghost town. And uh, so I finished that, and then I decided to uh, go to university and then apply to University of California at Berkeley. And, uh, but uh, at that time, the travel regulation was such that I couldn't do that. So I took uh, another year off uh, working in the sawmill, but then it gave me a chance to earn enough money to go to university without any problem. I, I think it was, uh, yeah, 1947. There was, uh, I, I don't know who gave us this information, was there somebody that uh, told us that you might be able to go to UBC at Vancouver. They, you know, you pr provided you have a RCMP travel permit, you could do that. So I applied. I think I was probably the only person that applied from there. So, come September, we m came to Vancouver. Two were from Kamloops, and I was from there. Uh, and then there were three from uh, Kelowna area, Kokonagan, but they were there. They were permanent uh, uh, residents, so they didn't have to evacuate. But uh, so those three, and there was another guy. Oh, yeah, another guy. I think he was a veteran. I think. Well, at least he was in the army. But I was uh, uh, one from uh, the these uh, no relocation center like uh, Castle. Or... And there was a man by name of Mr. McKinnon who was a. Uh, a commissioner or somebody, somebody way up in the uh, senior administration. And uh, he uh, was very, very uh, 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 for us to get education. But anyway, uh, from the uh, internment camps, that kind of thing, uh, probably I was the only one that uh, probably applied. So when I came to Vancouver, Mr. McKinnon, was responsible for this uh, was very very encouraging you know and uh, he uh, introduced uh, us to various uh, uh, people who were working for the Japanese cause including Dorsey Leipzig and uh, her uh, her uh, husband who was a secretary of the Civil Liberties Union Vancouver branch 
And so that was a good organization. I thought we cooperated quite well, you know. The, uh, and these, uh, the elder people were quite progressive, you know. Mr. Iwata, is, uh, is, uh, he, he owned the Roosevelt Hotel. And then there was uh, Mr. Tasaka, who was the ex Waseda man. And who else now? And uh, Mr. Arakawa, I think. He, I think he was a, sort of a Japanese uh, newspaper man. And there's a Master Kadota. So there's uh, enough uh, older people and enough younger people to uh, jointly do something. So I think that time, I, I think it was did well. At that time, the Vancouver branch of Civil Liberties Union consisted of maybe half of the English department at UBC, people from uh, economics, etc. And, and uh, so because the work was very good, I decided to join the campus branch of the Civil Liberties Union and became the vice president of that. And I didn't do too much work, but uh, some of the, uh, you know, some of the work they did were very good. And they were working for the Indian cause at that time, too. We started the uh, Japanese Canadian Citizens uh, Association in Vancouver, and quite a few of us were from UBC. When we came back to Vancouver, I think uh, the feeling I got was that uh, quite a few of the people were very, very sorry that it has happened. And that's why we, Outfit like Civil Liberties Union had lots of UBC staff, professors, who were in there trying to do something about that. So I participated in no, you know, in workshop and giving talks to PTAs and that kind of thing, and that, that we were not monsters at all. Well. So if, and there was very, very little discrimination at that time. There were some, but mind you, you have to remember that when I came, most of it was mostly veterans came back from the war, and they were, you know, they were really good. And I uh, enjoyed the association with those guys. Most of them are very, very good. I lived at the Acadia Camp, which was uh, again primarily for uh, for vet veterans, but the uh, university made allowance, so to let us in there. So, so you know, again, that's uh, very fortunate. Mr. Miller, who owned the Miller & Co. China, China store, and he was a, a very devout uh, Christian man, and but he put all the profit into uh, to organization that would uh, promote uh, harmony between groups, particularly race. So he had, uh, you know, all sorts of people there, and uh, I, uh, I was uh, representing the Japanese. Uh. In 1949, that was when we got the citizenship. Right? We had the right to vote, so they could all come back to the court without any problem. They're free. To, they were free. Well, Mr. Atagi had a boathouse and I don't know how many acres of land he ha he had. There were big machineries, lots of exotic lumber, and uh, he had boats too. And, uh, and he even had a blacksmith and that sort of thing. And they, they for all that and the property, he was only offered two thousand dollars. Oh, he, he, he weeped, you know, because, you know, he came to Canada when he was a teenager and established all that. That's hard work. He was in uh, Kamloops and had an accident, I think, and then uh, I think fell from a ladder or roof or whatever, and then ever since that, his uh, health uh, deteriorated. So he uh, didn't come to the coast. And not only him, but uh, some of the farmers that uh, opened up the Surrey area for strawberry farming, 
that was a real hard work, you know, before the days of bulldozer, they had to blast those stumps and all clear the forest to make uh, strawberry farms. I think that must have been very, very difficult, hard work. And then to lose that, that would be without, you know, very little, was very little compensation. I don't know how much they were paid, but that, not very much. So I feel sorry for those people from Surrey, Mission, and those places. Some of the guys that much, much smarter than my, myself, uh, who were, who didn't make, who didn't go to university. Lots of, well, you know, lots of them in my class too. I wish uh, they, because they were, you know, they would be a real college professor material. There's quite a few of them. It was that called Pacific Oceanographic Group in Nanaimo. Quite a few years, maybe 15 years or so, I worked in Nanaimo as an oceanographer. So when you had a master's, so I thought, well, I should uh, get a PhD somewhere. <laughs> you get better pay. So I was uh, interested in Liverpool University in England because this, this professor had written a textbook and I was interested in uh, him because uh, he wrote a very good book. So I decided to go there. In the meantime, Dr. Hidaka from, uh, from uh, Tokyo University has visited our institute at uh, Nanaimo. Well, this Dr. Hidaka was uh, one of the eminent uh, oceanographer, physical oceanographer at that time. You know, one of the few. He was even in in, in North America. He was a traveling lecture, a professor at University of Washington, and he, he, I think our government got him for, <coughs> to give some lectures at Nanaimo too. So he stayed for about a week. And while there, he was saying, you know, I said I'm interested in some graduate studies. He said, Well, why don't you come to my institute? I said, yeah, I said, well, I'm in interested in that. Uh, but uh, then I uh, wasn't, uh, you know, prepared to go right away. So later on, uh, the, there was a, a, a talk amongst the West Coast uh, officials that, uh, you know, it won't be a bad idea if I go to Japan, you see. And uh, the government was willing to fund that, uh, you know. And the reason is because all the, see, U UBC, Washington, and uh, California, we all had the same type of approach to work. And they thought that uh, going to a different institution will bring a different kind of, uh, you know, attitude and, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily technique, but some approach to a problem. I mean, and this has happened all over the world, you know, different institutions have different approach to the same problem, you see. So they thought it was a good idea, and uh, particularly the, uh, the, uh, the senior people. When I came to Tokyo, I found the language quite different from what the parents were, you know, used to. And uh, I said, my goodness, the parents are giving, giving us a bunch of yes, I thought, too. Because Tokyo language is quite different, very, very formal, you know. But, uh, well, I think in two weeks, two months, I think I was able to give uh, talks in Japanese, actually.
Uh, in, in our uh, area, like uh, uh, our parents' area, Kansai, which Osaka, Kyoto, that Wakayama, they have a, a, what you call a Kansai accent. On the second year I was there, I took a trip to my uh, parents' place to see what, whether, you know, whether the, to, to ascertain whether the language they were speaking in Stevenson was uh, was was what they spoke, and sure enough, you know, when you take uh, the train from Tokyo to Osaka, as you approach Osaka, the language there's some familiar familiar sound is coming out, and then when I would change the train at Osaka to go to Wakayama to Gobo, Wakayama, boy, the language really just became authentic to what what the parents were used to. And you know, it's amazing when you got to this village, Gobo was a, much a small city actually. That was exactly the language that the parents are speaking. Tokyo University, physics department, Tokyo University, is that, uh, you know, there are Nobel Prize uh, winners there. Most progressive, that, that department. And uh, when the people in the physics department, including oceanography, was uh, lecturing, they were lecturing in Japanese, but what they write on the blackboard is all English. So it was very easy for me to take notes, but I write in English, you see. So it was very easy to study. So it's, uh, that was interesting. But uh, it's, my goodness, those, uh, you know, like the, those, uh, the, the physics department at Tokyo University, and the same as Kyoto, they're, uh, you know, they're in the forefront of, uh, this, uh, at that time, the high energy physics. And things like, uh, you know, oceanography, physical oceanography and meteorology are way down. <laughs> Selected group, those professors are really good. And they all speak English, no problem. They speak German too. You know, German was the 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 ideal foreign language there. Well, in those days, people marrying outside your own uh, culture was uh, very rare. Uh, rare. I mean, it happened. It happened way before uh, my time, but it was uh, not as uh, uh, common as as it, it is now. So, uh, when that, I think people have changed since then. You know? I think my mother would have preferred that I married a Japanese girl. I think, judging from you know, but fa f father didn't say anything. I think in a way he was quite progressive, <laughs> even though he was a old, uh, you know, what do you call, uh, rebel. Well, without the uh, taggies, I don't think we would have survived, you know. And if it wasn't for the opportunity we had after the, during and after the war, we probably would be still in the same economical group. I think you have to give it to the general people too, that uh, under duress, they have uh, come out of it, positive. And I think that has been a big help to, 
in the coming generation, I think. The things that I would say is just think for yourself because, you know, sometimes when you think, if you have a notion, stick to it. You might be right. <laughs>